Pretty much every new trend that has stuck around in mountain biking was once considered unnecessary and just basically a fad. It's amazing to think just how much it's all changed the scene and made mountain biking as amazing as it is today. So let's have a look at some of these fads that have stuck around long enough to become trendy and necessary. Full suspension. Okay, this is what they used to say. It's not necessary, it's not efficient, and it's too complicated. It can't be done. These days, there's almost not a single full suspension bike that you can't buy that isn't, well, pretty great. Full suspension bikes have truly made mountain biking what it is today, and we wouldn't be able to ride the sort of things we do without them. They've changed the game. They're efficient, they're capable, they're just the best. But that wasn't the case in the early days of the sport. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, most bikes were fully rigid, and that meant rough and tough riding on bikes that just could never handle the kind of terrain we've come to expect of a modern mountain bike. So the desire for a fully suspended bike started to emerge, as much for comfort as for performance to begin with. A suspension concept started to become reality, fully suspended bikes started to find their place in the sport, mostly in downhill to begin with, where full-size bikes were starting to perform really well. But downhill bikes didn't have the same weight requirements of an XC bike, where obviously the weight is critical. Uh, it needed to be super lightweight in XC, so downhill didn't need that, and it also didn't need the same level of pedal efficiency which is so important when racing cross country. So full suspension XC bikes were a long way off for many years. It took a lot of development, testing and failure to arrive at the modern MTB suspension. Pedal efficiency got way better, weight got a lot less, geometry and linkage design uh, took huge leaps forward and then we finally arrived at the modern full suspension mountain bike. A bike that has evolved from those early days, originally a weird pipe dream that just couldn't happen, but now a very, very important bike. Basically the definition of our sport. The first fat bike came into existence shortly after mountain bikes came about. It was created by Steve Baker to traverse the snowy Alaskan wilderness. He literally welded two rims together uh, and doubled up the tires to make a super wide footprint on the soft snow. Um, so while many people think that the fat bikes are useless, they were obviously made for a very specific use on basically snow or loose sand and are really good at it. Um, and as Blake has shown in many videos, they can also do a lot more too. And when you think about it, fat bikes are another example of how the technology in mountain biking has taken such huge strides forward. A fat bike tyre uh, is essentially a super lightweight cross-country tyre, using all that tyre tech that has been developed over the years for cross-country to create something that's so big but light enough to perform well in its intended use. There's still definitely a bit of a trend side to fat bikes. Um, it isn't uncommon to see someone riding through a city centre on one, which is strange, or sometimes out on a standard trail uh, just using it like it's a normal bike, um, which is fine, but it's definitely not what it was intended for. Um, will that drop away? It might. What will remain is uh, the very niche use of a fat bike, riding extreme conditions in sand or snow, conditions where no other normal MTB could handle it um, and would ultimately fail. The fatty, however, stands itself up on them loose conditions and can take some rides that are simply impossible on anything else. Twenty-nine inch wheels, wagon wheels can't corner. They aren't strong and are just for XC, or so they say. Twenty-nine wheels made a huge uproar when first introduced, and are still stirring the pot over a decade later. Especially because they've just become a common sight at downhill races as well as cross country. Twenty-nine er bikes have come along in leaps and bounds, and we have pushed mountain bike performance that much further. The reason they caused such an uproar, well, to begin with, there was 
some skepticism that 29ers was just an industry trick to create another standard which would drive more bike sales. And maybe there's an element to that. However, the 29er got used more and more and the performance became more and more obvious. The rolling speed was a huge gain on cross country bikes and an instant hit. And then the unthinkable happened, the 29er downhill bike. And along with it, the realization that the rolling speed plus the modified geometry could create a completely different kind of downhill bike. Um, resulting in Greg Minard, basically one of the greatest of the sports and been winning races for 20 years, um, he basically said, I finally got a bike that fits me. Imagine how good he'd been if he'd got a bike that fitted him earlier on. His six foot four inch body size being one of the tallest on the World Cup downhill scene uh, meant that now the big 29er bike is perfect for him. In fact, 29 inch wheels and fat bikes brings me to another trend, the plus tire. Plus tires came about to bridge the gap between fat bikes and the traditional mountain bikes. The logic behind it was that you can get the rollover ability of a 29er based on the fact that the diameter of a plus tire on a 27.5 inch wheel is similar to a 2.3 tire on a 29 inch wheel. On top of that, you'd get the great traction and cushioning of the larger fat bike-esque tile. This initial splash sent ripples through the industry and now we have a large gray area between between plus and normal tires with 2.5, 2.6, 2.8 and 3.0 inch tires flooding the market. Which is cool because they've actually breathed new life into hardtails, making them more capable than ever before. There will always be die-hard riders who will never give in to the one-by phenomenon, but for those of us who did, it was a breath of fresh air, or I think so. Some of us have been doing it for years, bodging a two-by drivetrain to run one-by, and just dealing with the limited range in favour of a simplified cockpit, fewer drop chains. Uh, but when SRAM came out with the XX1 one-by dedicated drivetrain, that was a revelation. Since then, everyone has jumped on board, and one-by has gone full steam ahead. Like most great tech advances, uh, it seems like such a simple and obvious choice. Rather than three chain rings on the front, just have a much wider range on the back where you already have lots of sprockets. Uh, but take a moment to think about how radically the design had to change and the problems that had to be solved before the one by could ever be realized. The, the chain line, the, the derailleur size, the derailleur range, uh, the chain design improvements themselves, uh, rear cassette size, and the weight, so many difficult problems. But in the end, a simple idea has become a revolutionary change in the MTB performance, and it looks fantastic. There's nothing stopping people from just lowering the seat manually. Uh, until you can do it at the touch of the button though, it makes a big difference. Have you ever come across anyone who after trying a dropper post decides they don't like it? I really doubt it. It's transformed how we ride our bikes and how capable a lot of bikes can be. The entire design of mountain bike has changed because of it too. It's weird to think that a seat post can have such a big influence. It's always been known that your seat could whack you in the ass while you descend. Many an XC racer has been bucked over the bars on a steep descent because the height of that seat just didn't allow them to get far enough over the back of the bike. The dropper is a quirky idea, but like I said, once you try it, you will almost always decide you can no longer live without it. But don't miss the technological brilliance that's making this thing possible. Shimano first introduced a friction clutch on their first 10-speed XTR drivetrain. It was met with some reservations and was often considered unnecessary. However, you'll barely see a single mountain bike without a clutch derailleur now. Why? Because they keep the chain slack to a minimum, which keeps the bike quiet and more importantly, keeps the chain in place and not dropped. Nothing wrong with rim brakes, right? Except in the wet and the fact that you need to replace your rims and that you're limited for tire size and that they're not very powerful and that they're harder to pull. 
Yet, yeah, disc brakes were a trend that everyone knew was a good idea, but they took a few years before they really took over. Thank goodness they did. They're, they're a standard component now, and you very rarely see any rim brakes on a mountain bike unless it's a very cheap price point. The problem innovators like Hope Tech faced in trying to introduce disc brakes were things like weight. Uh, the rim brakes were lightweight, if nothing else, and that makes a huge difference, especially in those early days of mountain biking, where the lightness of a component was absolutely critical. Plus, the first discs didn't actually outperform rim brakes by that much. Over time, however, the introduction of hydraulics, lighter weight and incredible performance has made the disc brake a must-have and very hard to beat. Lastly, the mountain bike. What about the mountain bike itself? Yep, not everyone was totally sold on the idea. Big brands were actually a little slow to take up the idea in the first place, just adding maybe one or two models to their range of bikes. Nothing like the huge selection of bikes we have on offer today. We came across an interesting quote from a CEO of a famous bicycle brand, Rally. He basically said that mountain biking itself was a fad, a trend, something that won't catch on and there wasn't a significant market for mountain bikes. Oh, how things have changed. Check out this quote. We don't believe there is a significant market for mountain bikes. Can you believe he said that? Essentially, mountain biking is just another cycling industry fad. But he's looking back now, kicking himself. Uh, it seems the many advances that have initially felt like trends or fads even have become uh, defining details of mountain bikings in some examples, like the suspension. Many of them advanced our sport hugely, making riding possible that we could never really have dreamt about back in the early days of the sport. So thank goodness for the dreamers out there. So next time you see a new design uh, coming out from from the industry, a new idea or a new component, a new concept, uh, or another industry standard, dare I say it. Well, just think what could be the next leap forward in the sport of mountain biking. It could be that new fad. Thanks for watching, and I hope that was all really interesting and kept you entertained. If you'd like some more GMBN entertainment, then click just here for a fantastic video. Uh, and hit the globe to subscribe, because we would really like you to be a subscriber to our channel. Uh, if you hit the old thumbs up like, it helps people discover this video too. So don't forget to do that, and I will see you next up on GMBN.